Welcome back. This is ANT02 module on antennas and circuits. And we'll start today uh, with some show and tell. But really, what is the purpose of this lecture? We should always ask that in the first few minutes of the class. So you are probably very comfortable with circuit theory at the moment given that you're all juniors and seniors in electrical engineering. Um, and that means that you're very good at solving what we call linear lumped parameter circuits. And that's good. That's good. Uh, in fact, an antenna is more often than not a linear um, device. And you can replace it in a circuit. It behaves in a circuit often like a lumped parameter, perhaps uh, an inductor and a resistor, or a capacitance and a resistance of some sort. So we're going to start from that perspective since everybody's probably comfortable with it. And then from there, once you've got that comfort level, we'll move on into some of the more sophisticated um, concepts of antenna engineering involving radiation theory. That's when we'll really use the Maxwell's equations and um, some of the other reviewed lectures that I put online. So make sure that by antenna lesson number three or four, you've got those review videos pretty comfortably under your belt. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with our show and tell. Here we go. This is a very dirty circuit board. Uh, it doesn't work. You can see that there's a few missing components here. You'll find this is quite often the case in uh, Professor Durgan's show and tell section. Why? Because graduate students do not trust their professors with things that work. If a professor wants a show and tell device to take to his class, he's given something that didn't work, one of the rejects. And that makes perfect sense, right? There's a joke in our laboratory that says, if you want your equipment you're trying to get your thesis or something done with to continue to working you never show it to the faculty member because I used to be a good engineer I could make things work I could do all sorts of things in the laboratory but magically when I became a faculty member I can walk into a room and immediately stop hardware from working so keep that in mind uh, in your own studies and projects So what would have been here would be a capacitor. This is a microstrip board. Here is an SMA adapter. It goes from an SMA coaxial cable here to a microstrip transmission line. Microstrip means, of course, that one part of the transmission line is etched as a strip of copper or in this case milled, you can even see the kind of mill channel from this uh, circuit board that was made. And the back side of the circuit board, of course, is the return path of all the transmission lines, and that's a ground plane. Well, you notice this circuit board material is this white material. That's likely because this is a form of Rogers substrate. is different than the typical green FR4 that you're used to um, working with. FR4 is a marvelous substrate that's used all the world over for low-cost circuit boards. It does tend to get a little bit lossy up in the microwave regions. Uh, so many people, when they're building something that operates at 5.8 gigahertz or above, or even in the um, 
2 or 3 gigahertz, they'll often switch over to Rogers substrate because it's lower loss and that allows more signal to get through which is always important particularly for this little circuit because this is an energy harvesting circuit and I believe this particular circuit was designed for 5.8 gigahertz of operation which means you would hook an antenna to this it would receive microwave power at 5.8 gigahertz that would be the C band for those of you following along with the standard charts and that signal would come in here and over here this is a diode an RF diode which if you look at the way this thing is made here's your antenna I'm using the universal bent coat hanger symbol for an antenna there's that capacitor here there's a path it connects to a diode which likely shuts to ground I don't know if you can see it but this thing here is likely a via to ground a connection and it looks to be also a break here in this direction to what would be some capacitive connections that allow charge to build up. So the wave comes in, some of the wave goes through, some of it comes back, and because this is a diode, it allows positive charge to flow this way, but not this way. So that on the negative cycles, or the positive cycles of the RF wave in this circuit, charge is going through on the negative wave it's going back and so you get some negative charge building up on here negative here as the charge depletes positive here and you could hook this up to a low power um, load that requires DC voltage and drive the circuit with that. Now the reason why I included this as the show and tell is because you can see a lot of other things go on and this is part of the black magic of RF and microwave engineering. For example, what is this thing just sticking out here? Well, this would be a parallel stub for those of you that have taken 4350. It's just an open circuit, so this doesn't connect to anything down here. It's an open circuit that just has a certain design length over here. You know, open circuits don't affect circuits except when you have RF length because of load uh, transition effects on transmission line. This open circuit, if you make it a little bit of length, less than a quarter of a wavelength, it looks like a capacitor that's been hooked in parallel here. And that capacitor, when you move it a little bit further down the line, will look at this terminal where this other capacitor connects, kind of like an inductor, because you'll have gone a significant distance around the Smith chart to get to there. And then you'll notice that the line changes width, which of course means that its intrinsic impedance is no longer the same as it was at the beginning of the line, which is another way to continue to match the circuit. And then over here, we break back into thicker lengths as well, back to what looks to be almost like the original impedance of this line to connect the diode, and then these other capacitors, which you'll notice have also been desoldered because my students are as stingy as I am about microwave components, always reusing. Now what's interesting about this too is that you'll see 
that there's some resonant links here and here. This is probably more complicated than you need to just to, to match just a basic diode. What does a diode really look like uh, in RF without all this other stuff going on? Well, a diode really looks like a capacitor and a resistor. And there's some inductance in there too. Sometimes people draw that as a simple inductor, but they can represent it with more complicated models. This is a good basic model. At some frequency below a certain threshold, you can ignore this inductance and just concentrate on these things. So the point is that the terminals of a typical RF capacitor, you would have something like x ohms minus jy equivalent impedance at a single harmonic time harmonic frequency now ultimately almost all of your reference cables like this one are set at 50 ohm impedance that's a standard impedance that RF engineers use and we use it because all of our devices and cables and other adapters are at 50 ohms and if you keep everything at a constant reference impedance that means you're not going to get ringing and transmission line effects between them you kind of nipped all those reflections in the bud you're not wasting f power any power that you set into a perfectly matched system like that using 50 ohm components won't send anything back to the source as waste. So we like that. But was the interesting thing is in a lot of these uh, rectifiers some of these extra design lengths and transmission line effects and this circuit is really no different. These effects um, aren't just ma matching at the fundamental. So for example this is designed with all these complicated uh, matching circuits and surface mount components. They're chosen so that you present 50 ohms at 5.8 gigahertz. But of course this is a highly nonlinear circuit and we know one thing about nonlinear circuits is that they do not keep the frequency the same throughout. So if I set a 5.8 gigahertz waveform into here I'm going to possibly get some harmonics there. 2 times 5.8, 3 times 5.8, 4 times 5.8, and etc. One of the neat things about energy harvesting circuits is that uh, you can reflect some of these higher order harmonics back into the diode to get it to behave more uh, efficiently. So one of the problems with any type of energy harvesting, let's look at just the simplest possible harvesting circuit you could think of, the half wave rectifier, just a diode and a capacitor connected to an antenna. Wave comes in here, current flows onto here, deposits over here, negative charge over here and then on the negative cycle when this is negative here with respect to ground nothing can flow past this diode so this charge just sort of stays here and you basically now have a charge that builds up you can connect this after a certain amount is built up to a load that load could be a low-powered microcontroller or an integrated circuit or something that does computation or communication or sensing or something like that. And here you have a basic RF energy harvesting thing. Now, one of the problems with RF energy harvesting is that it always fails you when you need it the most. When the power level drops, this circuit begins to convert the power inefficiently. Why is that? Well, there's threshold voltage to get this diode to turn on. In other words, you have to invest some of your voltage into this diode and hence some of the energy to actually get it to turn on and act like a rectifier. 
So RF energy harvesting signals are very weak to begin with. You're getting hundreds of millivolts in the best case scenario, not tens of volts like you would if you had plugged this circuit into uh, a DC power supply that came from the wall. And so matching is very critical. We want to match this to 50 ohms because we don't want to reflect anything out of here. And we also want to add some matching so that some of these harmonics actually boost this, the raw voltage across this diode in a way that allows it to forward conduct as efficiently as possible. It winds up being a very complicated and elegant design uh, process. And we'll work a little example, at least, of just basic matching using our knowledge that we'll gain from this lecture on antennas and circuits. So let's go ahead and take a look at transmit antennas in circuits. So here on the top part here, I have our classic block diagram of antenna and receiver. The transmitter, which is the source of the system, feeds a signal into an antenna. That antenna sends a radio wave to a receiver antenna, which then dumps this power into a receiver and detects a signal, harvests energy, uh, decodes communication, something like that. And so if we wanted a basic circuit model of this system, what we would start off with is a voltage source and an impedance to represent my transmitter box. And in transmit mode, an antenna really just looks like an equivalent impedance. Some Thevenin equivalent value in ohms, usually complex, that represents the amplitude and phase ratio of voltage to current that the antenna accepts. And then over here, we have the same situation except now the receive antenna looks like a source. So not just an impedance, Z sub A, but also a voltage, what we call here V prime of A, uh, an amplitude of a voltage. And that, of course, is what drives the current and voltage across the load. So, one of the interesting things to note is that these two are labeled exactly the same. If these are the two same types of antennas, regardless of whether you're using it as a transmitter and a receiver, it turns out that those two values are the same. You can use them. You don't have to measure them twice, one in transmit mode, one in receive mode. And this is due to some magic property in electromagnetics called the reciprocity theorem. We may talk about that a little bit later. It's very important to antenna engineers. Now, let's start about the trans transmission mode antenna and I figure out what's going on just in this circuit problem right here so what I call and what antenna books call P sub T is a value that's typically measured in watts and that is transmit power uh, into the antenna. Now, that may not necessarily be the same as the actual power generated or available to be provided by the transmitter, and that's because not all transmitter and antenna systems are going to be optimized to maximum power level. So for example, if I know what the source is here, V sub S, and I know what that amplitude is, then P sub T, the actual power delivered to this load, and I'm talking about real power here, is PT one half the real value of my voltage across the antenna 
in this half over here and that's going to multiply i sub a complex conjugate this is basically how we come up with power in the phasor domain we take the voltage times the current just like you do in a, a dc circuit but we need that complex conjugate there because i can be complex and we also need the one half there because this is an average power averaged over one cycle of a sine wave. Remember we could omit this one half in the DC realm, but not in RF, we deal with average powers. The very peak instantaneous power occurs when this product is maximized instantaneously and then we know that there's gonna pass through zero and you're gonna get the opposite polarity and then it's gonna pass through zero again. These are sinusoidal quantities that oscillate. What's interesting here is that you can't just take one half times voltage times current. That's going to give you a complex value, which still has physical meaning. There'll be P real plus J P imaginary. The real part in this expression is actually powered absorbed. And since that's what we're finding, we're just going to take the real part. This is also an interesting quantity. It's the reactive power, uh, part of the volt amp reactance of the entire system here. It represents stored power in a system. And whenever you get P imaginary, you know, there's some reactive components like some capacitances and some inductances uh, hidden in that little black box that we're calling Z sub A. So, really, when you couch it in this term, we really just have a simple circuit problem. In this case, Z sub S is our source impedance, which we'll write as R sub S plus J X sub S if we want to break it down into real imaginary terms. Likewise, Z sub A is going to be R sub A plus J X sub A. So we have our reactive components, the imaginary parts here, and the real value parts of the um, impedance in ohms rep represented by R with a subscript. So if I actually go through this and I do a voltage divider equation, I won't beat you to death with the details here. You all know how to take voltage dividers, hopefully. But t P sub T becomes the magnitude squared of the current of the uh, input voltage V sub s times R sub a the real value of the antenna impedance divided by two magnitude Z sub s so all of this plus Z sub a squared all of this so you add those two imaginary impedances together, complex impedances together, take the magnitude squared times two, put it in the denominator. And this gives you an expression for power. And if you want to check that volt unit wise, we have units of volt squared, resistance on top and resistance squared on the bottom. So that's gonna be volt squared per ohms, which we know is watts. Okay, so what would I do to maximize this circuit. And this is one of the basic circuit uh, questions that you're asked when you first learn circuit theory uh, with time harmonic systems using phasers. Uh, and it's not a trick, trick question. You always use a complex conjugate load to maximize power. Z sub S is equal to Z sub A. The condition that we know in electrical engineering as max power transfer. Well, if you do that, then this simplifies somewhat. We assume that the imaginary components of Z sub S and Z sub A canceled so that all that are really left are is R sub S and R sub A. And of course, if this holds, then R sub A 
and R sub S are really the same thing. So under maximum power transfer, this value here should be equal to two R A quantity squared. And then you have V sub S R A, the square on the V C of S at the top. So under maximum power transfer, you can simplify this at V S squared over 8 RA. RA's cancel, one of those cancels with one of the RA's in the denominator, and we have 2 squared and then another 2. So this is the best you can do. The most power available. Now, unless you've ha hit this value perfectly, with your antenna design, and you really have designed Z sub A to be the perfect complex conjugate of Z sub S, unless you've done that, you're never going to achieve actual exact maximum power transfer. So let's go ahead and denote this as a max. The actual amount that you transmit is going to be P sub T over p sub t max which should only depend on circuit parameters and so if I divide that those two expressions that I found earlier uh, what I get is 4 r a over magnitude Cs complex plus Za complex and this should be Ra squared because if I look up here yep I got an Ra up there too so, what you can show is that for all realistic passive values of CA and ZS, this value is always going to be less than or equal to 1. It'll be a real value, always less than or equal to 1. 1 denotes perfect transmission. 100% transmission, which occurs under that maximum power transfer condition of perfect conjugate matching. And it can go all the way down to zero. And that of course happens when pretty much the case when R sub A is zero and you only have reactive components on your antenna. So this metric here, this is important, keep this in your notes because this tells you basically what are the mismatch losses in my system? I'm going to go back up here to the diagram here. I have so much power available, but only a portion of that is actually going to make it into the actual circuit for transmission. Where does the rest of that power go? It gets reflected back to the source. So, this is important because quite often when you work in link budgets in antenna engineering, you'll be dealing with received power into uh, or out of the terminals of a receive antenna or transmit power into an antenna. However, there can be significant sources of losses here and also here, uh, as we'll see in a moment. And so this is really the first step in calculating these losses. What percentage of the power makes it into the transmit antenna? Let's do the same thing for a receiver antenna. So on the receive antenna side, we'll say that 
we've got Z sub L, which will be a load resistance plus some sort of load reactance. And we have the exact same Z sub A equals R sub A plus J X sub A. Again, we'll use the exact same load formula. In this case, we're going to say, what is the power delivered to the load? PL. This is going to be one half the real value of VA, the voltage across the terminals of my load or the terminals of the antenna, times IA complex conjugate. And if I do my voltage divider like I did the last time, this is going to be VA prime squared R sub L divided by 2 uh, Z sub A complex plus Z sub L squared, magnitude squared. So we see a lot of symmetry in these formulas, not surprisingly. Uh, whether the transmitter is acting as, or the antenna is acting as a transmitter, or it's acting as a receiver. Now again, what's maximum power transfer? That occurs when RA plus JXA is equal to RL minus JXL. The resistances are the same for antenna impedance and load impedance and the reactive components are oppositely uh, uh, signed. Now, the maximum power, of course, happens when this condition holds and it produces VA prime squared over 8RA and so this is the most amount of power that a, an antenna can possibly deliver to a circuit. If you don't have a matched condition then what's going to happen is that your load is going to deviate by some sort of similar mismatch factor for RL, RA, ZA plus ZL squared times PR. We can call this a mismatch factor. Again, it's going to be between 0 and 1, inclusive. 0 is I've got perfect reflection from my load. 1, I've got perfect delivery to my load, the complex conjugate, maximum power transfer, and all the realistic cases in between are really going to be somewhere in between 0 and 1. Now, a couple notes about this. First of all, the mismatch factor can be reported in dB. Because we're dealing with powers, and RF engineers like to deal with powers, um, since that's sort of the brass tacks of whether or not you can conduct communications or harvest enough energy or detect a signal, um, then you will often see this reported as a dB value, which means you take 10 log base 10 of the mismatch factor. Some people put a minus sign in there and call it loss. Return loss, really. Now, one of the interesting things about this is, if we go back to our circuit here, if you're familiar with transmission lines and circuit theory, it's pretty easy to understand this circuit. 
you have a source that sends power here. If it's not batch matched, some of that power is going to be wasted and reflected right back into the source. Here, it's a little bit different. I have a receiver antenna, and it's sending power to a load, unless it's perfectly matched. Some of that power is going to be wasted and sent back into the source. You always have to remember, though, that these are equivalent circuits, V sub A and Z sub A. They represent the lint behavior of an antenna um, in a linear circuit, but they may not necessarily have physical analogs. What's actually happening to that power if you have a mismatch between your receive antenna and your receiver? Well, the power goes in, some of it reflects out, and it turns back into a radio wave. So it's interesting to think that there's always a tiny, minute amount of power that makes it all the way back to the transmitter every time you try to communicate with another antenna. This could be your cell tower. This could be your handset. And despite the engineer's best efforts to match RX uh, antenna with a hardware of the receiver, there could be 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the power that makes it back here, and then it must travel and broadcast back, a tiny bit of it falling on the transmit antenna and coming right back into the transmitter. Always strange to think about, but that's the way the physics works. You can even use that to your advantage if you're an antenna engineer. Now, one other thing that I want to do at the receiver side that we didn't do at the transmitter side is talk about the magnitude of the voltage. If I solve the circuit theory components of this, I do the voltage divider and solve for voltage instead of power, V sub A, is equal to the magnitude of the phase of sub A, which is here on the output terminals of the antenna. But it turns out that this is going to be 2 times Z sub L times the square root of 2 RA P sub R divided by Z A plus Z L. P sub R is my received power. It's actually what you calculate when we do the um, Frisk free space equation. We haven't done it yet in this class, but this is considered received power by the antenna. The most power available doesn't necessarily mean it's the power that's coupled into your circuit, as you need to know R sub A, Z sub L, Z sub A to figure that out. And this will give you an answer in volts as to the magnitude of the voltage. That's sometimes important because the magnitude of the voltage will determine if you, for example, have railed an amplifier, or if we're in the energy harvesting example that we talked about at the first part of class during show and tell, uh, if you've got enough voltage to invest in a conversion circuit. So, let's see. And this is interesting because you do not necessarily have to have maximum power transfer to have maximum voltage transfer. That's something that's very important to understand, especially in a nonlinear circuit. The things that make for the most power don't necessarily make for the highest voltage across the receiver. Hopefully you saw that example of paradox um, in uh, your own lives uh, when you were first learning circuit theory. So let's do a quick calculation. What is the voltage on a 50 ohm cable that's carrying 20 dBm 
of RF power. Okay, 20 dBm. What does that even mean in this class? Well, of course, 20 dBm. dBm's are decibel milliwatts. So if I want to convert this back to milliwatts, all I have to do is divide by 10 and then raise 10 to that power. So this is going to be 100 milliwatts or 0.1 watts. W's. So we'll use the dBm scale and dBw scale decibel watts quite a bit in this class. You may not be comfortable with it yet but by the end of the course you'll be thinking and dreaming in dBs. You'll go to the store and you'll say wow that's a great deal. Kroger marked down this ground beef 75%. That's 6 dB off. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We converted it into watts. And now, if we look at our formula here. If I want the power, the maximum amplitude from a power level, in a matched system, then this simplifies considerably to just square root of 2 RA P sub R. We said P sub R is 0.1 watt. If this is a 50 ohm cable, then 2 times R sub A is going to be 100 ohms. So this is going to be, when you multiply these together, the square root of 10, or about 3.16 volts. So that's actually a useful reference. Sometimes it's easy to uh, lose sight of what the actual voltages are on a transmission line. We tend to be using very, very low values a lot in RF. But every once in a while you'll send a watt or 10 watts or 100 watts from an amplifier into an antenna. You have to realize that the voltage actually starts to build up at that point. If I send 1 watt into a 50 ohm antenna by this formula, I'll actually have a 10 volt peak to peak signal. And if I were to have a 100 watt signal in a 50 ohm cable, that would be 100 volts. Start to talk about some serious swing there. And remember, 100 watts may sound like a lot, but it's really just what uh, a light bulb emits, an old incandescent light bulb, most of which was wasteful heat. But still, you don't think of a white light bulb as necessarily a high-powered application, particularly an old in, even an old incandescent light bulb. Okay, so that's one example on how to use these formulas to calculate amplitude. Let's do a slightly more sophisticated example. Here's the one that I'm going to write up here. It says we're going to do an example from RF rectification kind of go full circle back to the show and tell uh, device that we talked about earlier. And here we have a 50 ohm antenna. Receives 10 dBm of power. And is connected to a microwave energy harvesting circuit with impedance 30 minus J 100 ohms. So of course low impedance 
the resistive part plus a capacitive reactive component. What must the threshold be threshold 1h to turn on the circuit. So we're going to assume here that we have the basic half wave rectifier circuit or some deviation or derivative of that where RF is coming into the antenna charge is deposited up here and I've got a turn on this diode so this capacitor if it's designed well in an RF scenario this should short out at the desired frequency so that I'm really just connecting this from straight from antenna to ground and so my load that I'm turning on is really that diode we said at the frequency that we're operating at because of the junction capacitance of the diode this thing looks like 30 minus J 100 ohms that's our Z sub L and let's see what it is this is a 50 ohm antenna so R sub A is equal to 50 ohms X sub A is zero no reactive component And the way that this problem is worded, we've got to receive at least 10 dBm in this circuit. Let's convert this straight to linear watts, because all of our report values in dBm and dBws, because of the extreme disparity of power levels that we use in RF, we need that logarithmic scale to talk about the negative 110 dBm signal that your phone is receiving that can still decode a data waveform. So we're talking about femtowatts at that point. But there's also on the flip side the same power level that's being put into a transmit antenna could be 14, 15, 16, 17 orders of magnitude higher than that. And so to talk about powers in the same system we love that decibel scale. This is easy enough to calculate. You take 10 divided by 10, raise 10 to that power, so it's really 10 to the first power, that's 10 milliwatts, or 0 0.01 uh, watts, the natural unit that we should be working in. Okay, now, we said VA, is equal to 2 times the magnitude of ZL times square root of 2 RL PR divided by ZL plus ZA. Now, this in here, this is going to be 30 minus J100 for the ZL plus 50 ohms for the ZA. And I take the magnitude of that so I really have here is 80 squared plus 100 squared. Take the square root. Over here, my R sub L <coughs> is 30. We said P sub R is 0 0.01. And this is the magnitude of 
my load impedance, which is really 30 squared plus 100 squared, take the square root or raise it to the one half power. So that's how you calculate the magnitude of that. Let's go ahead and put this into the Magic Professor calculator where everything in the example is calculated ahead of time and I wind up getting 0.16 volts or 160 millivolts. And that's a really nice circuit if that's what's really turning on the diode. Usually that's the, probably approaching the turn on voltage of a Schottky, a really good Schottky diode. Typical threshold for that. Those are good diodes to use for energy harvesting because they tend to have a lower threshold voltage than say a silicon diode with its 700 millivolt turn on voltage. Turn on voltage is one of those things you can actually dope uh, and control to some level uh, depending on the substrate that you've picked and the doping levels and the dopants and all of those other material properties. So there you have it. That's how antennas behave in circuits. That's how you calculate mismatch losses. And power transmissions. What percentage of the power makes it into the circuit? What may percentage reflects back? Uh, and this is also how you calculate amplitudes physical amplitudes of voltages and currents coming out of antennas and going into them. You always have to be aware because in antenna engineering sometimes this is included in some of the quantities that we talk about like gain and other times it's not. So you should always be aware of the definition of things that you're using and whether or not they've included mismatched losses because you may have to go back and calculate that using the equations from this lecture. So, next lecture, antennas 03. And this is where we start doing a little bit of radiation theory en route to a discussion on the Hertzian dipole. So I look forward to seeing you back for that one as well.